Let's begin reading. I'll read verses 1 through 4 in Proverbs 18, and we'll get into our study. Solomon writes, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. When the wicked comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes reproach. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. So as we begin, obviously, we'll be looking at these uh, one at a time and continuing our series here in the book of Proverbs, a book that uh, promises to give to us insight into wisdom. And so as we've gone through the previous chapters, that's what Solomon has been doing. He's been instructing in wisdom. Continuing here in chapter 18, he begins to give, give us once again some very practical insights. And so in verse 1, he says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. So this speaks of a person who refuses to listen to other people's counsel. I know nobody in this room ever refuses advice. I realize that. So hypothetically, speaking of other people in some other country or some other world, he's speaking of people who refuse to listen to somebody's advice. This is a person who rejects other people's insights, and this is someone who refuses to listen when they're corrected. This is somebody who knows what he wants to do. He already knows what he's going to do. And so when somebody speaks to them, they just will not listen. They won't listen when others will say to them, that's not a good thing to do because they've already decided what they're going to do. And that happens uh, every day, many times a day. I've had more than one opportunity to minister to somebody who is uh, coming to me with a request for advice and to spend time with that person only to have them choose to do the exact opposite of what they were advised to do. Not that they have some kind of obligation to do everything that I'm saying, but sometimes when you give a piece of advice that is scriptural, it's solid, it's proper, there are those who reject it. Like the man who called the church, said, I need an emergency time with Pastor David. I have to see him. And uh, the secretary says to him, I'm sorry, pastor's preparing a Bible study. He says, listen, it's an emergency. I need to be there. I need to speak to him. I want to speak to him. So my secretary calls me and says, there's somebody who wants to speak to you right now. Can you see them for a little while? And I say, yes, of course. You know, tell him to come in at lunchtime. If it's that important, of course, I'll make some time for him. And so he comes in during the lunch hour and he says to me, I know it's, it's, it's noon. I don't take lunch anyway. It doesn't matter. But he says, it's noon. I left my job and um, I just needed some advice and, and I knew I could ask you for it. And he asked the question. He says, I just need a, it's a Bible question, really. He says, if a man divorces his wife, even though no sin has occurred in the marriage, but he just divorces her and he marries somebody else, is that a forgivable sin? So when he asked the question like that, is that a forgivable sin? Well, you know, every sin is forgivable when it's repented of and confessed and forsaken. And I was a young pastor at the time. I hadn't experienced this kind of thing before. So I thought he was thinking or speaking theoretically. So I said, well, you know, every sin is forgivable. And should a person sin and even do something like that, God forgives God forgives a repentant sinner. And he said, well, thank you. That's all I wanted to know. It only took like five minutes. And he left. And then it comes back to me later on how that he had come to get permission to leave his wife to marry a woman he was having an adulterous affair with. You see, so this, this isn't just theoretical uh, words that we find in Scripture. This is very practical and very real. And Solomon is saying it, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. A man who is not willing to hear other people is only going to do what he wants to do himself. He rages against all wise judgment, all sound wisdom, literally. You see, when you voluntarily pull yourself away, you are left to your own selfishness. And the fruit is rejecting wise counsel. 
often feeling that the counsel that has been given to you is really useless. But remember Proverbs 15, verse 22, where it says, without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. In verse 2, he says, a fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. Again, this is someone who cannot listen to others in order that he might understand them. There are, there are people who, if someone is speaking to them, they're not really listening. What they're doing is they're waiting for that person to stop talking so they can fill up the silence with their own voice. They're not really there to listen to somebody else. They, they don't want to understand somebody else. In order to understand somebody else, you need to patiently listen so that you can figure out what they're saying. We all know that. Those of us who are married know that. We know that I, as a man, I speak Greek. My wife speaks Martian. I mean, we speak two different languages. And so in order for her to understand me and for me to understand her, I've had to learn to listen. She has had to learn to listen in order to value, in order to understand. But there are people who don't value other people's opinions. They don't desire to understand. They basically simply want to give their own, uh, their own understanding. That's what it means when it says in verse 2, the last portion, when it says, but in expressing his own heart. It's not really desiring to know somebody else's because they have no interest in what others may have to say. What he has to say, though, is coming from what would be called a fallen or degenerate heart, and therefore is ignorant of the things of the Lord. He has no interest in learning. This is a person who, who doesn't read books. He's not interested in the things of the Lord. He's unteachable. And eventually the scripture says, scripture teaches that he will come to ruin. Verse three, when the wicked comes, contempt comes also. With dishonor comes reproach. Wickedness produces what is called contempt. The word contempt means shame. Wickedness produces shame. It produces dishonor or disgrace. And also reproach, which is another word for scorn. Uh, ultimately, what happens when it says the wicked, with the, uh, when the wicked comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes reproach. U ultimately, wickedness results in reproach, or when somebody is wicked, ultimately they are rejected by people. Very few people want to be hanging around with some wicked person. And that's the point he's making there. Verse four, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. So this gives us basically two pictures. Notice the pictures. One is a picture of a well, and the other is a picture of a spring. So when he speaks of a, a man's mouth, the words of a man's mouth being deep waters, well, that, that gives us the thought of something deep because wells can be deep. It, it actually is a picture of a depth of wisdom. Well, the well spring pictures wisdom flowing out. And when wisdom is flowing out, like water refreshes a thirsty person, wisdom is also intended to refresh other people. So he's saying a wise person will refresh others with a continuous supply of blessing and counsel. In Proverbs 20, verse 5, it says, Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Now, if you want to be somebody who gives good counsel, remember Colossians 3.16, because there it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you want to be somebody who gives good counsel, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That way, when you're communicating advice to somebody, it's not just going to be a series of things that you come up with yourself through your own experience, but it's going to be the word of God that actually is the, the food that God gives to the hungry soul. It's the water that quenches the person who's spiritually thirsty. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it go deeply in you and let it come out of you, refreshing other people. Verse five, it is not good to show partiality to the wicked or to overthrow the righteous in judgment. Um, 
plainly spoken, judgment must be unbiased and it must be impartial. It is never right to decide in favor of somebody when you don't take all things into consideration and judge a righteous judgment. According to the Old Testament book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 15, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. I've had people who have gotten upset with others and they have said, well, this person has offended my brother or has offended my sister. And then they will say, and I've heard this more than once, they say things like, you know, blood is thicker than water. And so is ketchup for that matter. But they'll say blood <laughs> is thicker than water. And the point they're making is I'm going to defend my brother or my sister because they are my brother or my sister. But that's not impartial judgment because your brother or your sister may be wrong. And there are people who carry these things in their heart towards others because they're taking offense at what the other person may have done, but they're not being fair in their judgment. They're not being impartial. One of the things that we need to learn to be is a righteous judge, impartial in our judgment. And so it's never right for us to show judgment with partiality. Verse six, a fool's lips enter into contention. His mouth calls for blows. That's a word we still use to this day, right? He's just throwing blows. You know, we still use that word. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Uh, basically, we've seen this to be true. Argumentative people get into trouble. They get into trouble. They end up having a real problem. And so it's always wise to... To, to restrain your speech. Like it says in Proverbs 13, verse 3, he who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. And so it's always wise to, uh, to guard your speech. And a fool's lips, according to verse 6, will enter into contention. They're argumentative, they cause problems, and they have nothing but arguments with other people. Verse 8. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. They go down in the inmost body. This is uh, interesting. Um, a, a, a real basic way to see this is, is to say um, people are greedy and hungry for gossip. Some are. Some are very greedy and hungry for that. It's interesting how it's how it's. How it's posed here, though, the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. They're, they're like um, sweets. You go to a pastry shop and, and you see these uh, pastries of some sort, whatever it may be that you like so much. And uh, for some people, the words of a talebearer, a talebearer is a gossip. It's a person who's bearing something and they're bearing a tale. They're taking a story and they're bringing it to you. And so he says the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. For some people, they just love to hear gossip. They just love it. And he says, and they go down in the inmost body. They just devour it. They're greedy for it and they like it. Well, the Bible tells us in Leviticus 19, verse 16, you shall not go about as a talebearer among your people. Proverbs 26, verse 20, we'll get there in a few years. Proverbs 26, 20 says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there's no talebearer, strife ceases. You know, it, you know that old saying, don't throw kerosene on a fire. You know, if there is no wood, the fire goes out. There's no reason to keep provoking people so that the argument continues. But there are some people who simply love to hear gossip about other people. It's very sad, but it's very true. Verse nine, he who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Uh, slothful is a word we don't use anymore. It speaks of being lazy. So he who is slothful in his work is a person who's always looking for shortcuts because they're lazy. And ultimately he's saying, that's gonna cause you great problems. When I was a kid, uh, I, I, I was very lazy. I mean, I would do almost anything to get out of work. 
And my dad would do almost anything to get me to work. So it was quite an interesting way of life for a long time. I, I remember as a kid going to a catechism and learning the Ten Commandments. And uh, I was only seven years old. And my dad wasn't a religious man by any means. Um, but he respected the fact that my mom was sending me to catechism classes to learn some basics of religion. I guess he felt that religion was good, at least a little religion was good for people, I don't know. But I do remember this, I do remember that it was Sunday, and I do remember my father saying to me, son, you need to rake up those leaves and throw it in that trash can. I was seven years old. I still remember the conversation. I said, I'm sorry, father, I can't. He says, what do you mean you can't? I said, dad, I can't. I said, you're not to work on the Sabbath. And he said, what? What? My dad got all mad. He goes, what? I said, no, my, my catechism teacher said that we're supposed to have a day of rest and that Sunday is our day of rest. And I'd already gone to mass and all of that. I said, so, um, dad, I, I, I am sorry, but I cannot pick up those leaves because that's work and I'm supposed to have a day of rest. My dad was so mad, but he picked up the leaves. My dad picked them up. So I learned very early how to con my dad. I really did. I had another tactic that was very effective. My dad was one of these guys who wanted the work done rapidly, just get it done. And so once again, it, it had to do with leaves. My dad had raked up a pile of leaves and he said, son, pick those leaves up and throw them in the trash can. He thought he had me because it wasn't Sunday. And so what I would do is I would lay on my side and I would, with one hand, I would pick up the leaves and drop them in the trash can. Then I just reach over. And my dad was in the garage. I still remember this. And my dad was watching me. He got so mad, he came and picked them all up at one time and threw. See, so I learned to be a slothful man at the age of seven. And so laziness is not something that the Lord blesses. And a long time ago, the Lord began to try and teach me not to look for shortcuts because ultimately it just causes problems. In Proverbs 24, verses 30 through 32, uh, it reads, I went by the field of a lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. There it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. Laziness ends up with just a messed up house, basically. It's just, it's not productive. Verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own esteem. So what this is doing here is it's contrasting a faith in God, the name of the Lord being a strong tower, with faith in money. Verse 11, the rich man's wealth is his strong city. So it's contrasting faith in God with faith in material things. Jesus gave a, a, a story, it's found in Luke 12, that it is appropriate for this. In Luke 12, verses 16 through 21, Luke says he spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. There I will store all my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. When you put your trust in riches, they are what are called uncertain. 
In 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, Paul said it like this. He said, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So the attitude towards wealth is very simple. Don't rely on it. Why? Because you may be rich today and tomorrow the stock market crashes and you lose everything. I, I heard somebody who was speaking just a couple days ago about how there was a particular stock market crash not that long ago and they pretty much lost most of their savings for their retirement in just a day. All these months and years of putting money away. Now, of course, this is not to say that we shouldn't be wise and prepare for the future, and I'm, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that for some people, wealth is their future. That is what they trust in. That is something that they expect to be able to benefit from later on. And when it does crash, which it can do, they end up with nothing. But the person who trusts in the Lord, though they lose everything, yet they don't lose the totality of reality because they still have the Lord and they have something that will take them through even crashes. And so the wisest thing that we can do is understand that God is our strong tower. He's the one who keeps us safe. The righteous run to him really and are safe. But the rich man, well, he puts all of his trust in his wealth very often and in his own esteem, it produces high walls. But the problem is, is those high walls are not gonna protect him. You see, God is the one who protects and provides for us. In Psalm 18, verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Proverbs 11, 4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Verse 12, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, before honor is humility. This isn't always true, but it's true very often. Those who are very, very rich are often also very, very proud. And when they are very, very rich, they can look at their poor neighbors and begin to look at them as being somewhat inferior to them. So if anyone is ever going to have genuine honor, well, the very first thing that they really need is humility. Because humility is the one, is one of the qualities of a person who fears the Lord. And humility is the road to honor from God. In Proverbs 15, verse 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom before honor is humility. I had a guy I knew. His name was Lucky. He had one eye, one hand, one leg, and we called him Lucky. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but his nickname was Lucky. And uh, I was a new, a new Christian, and he had recently come to faith in the Lord. I was 20 years old, and he was probably 50. So he was, you know, a lot older than I. And I had been reading the Bible and trying to grow in the things of the Lord. And he and I were having a conversation at my parents' house. I still remember how he and I were visiting. And as we were speaking, he was bragging. And, and he had a habit of boasting. He did. I, you know, he, he'd boast about almost everything all the time. So finally, you know, as a young believer, I, I, I got tired of hearing him bragging because if there's anything that, that I have a personal problem hearing it's when someone boasts I, I just it's just one of those things that bothers me when someone's bragging I just don't like it and uh, man he was somebody who liked to like to brag so finally I said to him listen lucky I have to tell you something because I'd been reading the Bible I mean all 20 years old how you know fount of wisdom right but I'm reading the Bible and so I said listen the Bible says before honor is humility and and that pride goes before destruction i said you need to seek the lord for humility 
I'll never forget his answer. He looks at me and he says, I am humble. He goes, David, I'm the most humble man I know. <laughs> and I said, is your name Trump? No, and, and as I... <laughs> anyway, uh, that's one thing that gets to me with that guy. Um, before honor is humility. Okay, somebody says, well, that, that's theoretically great. H how can I learn to be humble? Now, that's, that's really a practical question. How can I learn to be humble? Uh, I was taught this a long time ago. Uh, all you need to do is read the word of God and look closely at Jesus and then compare yourself with him. If that doesn't produce humility, I don't know what will. Because who here is as good as he? Who here can compare to him? I mean, it's easy for me to, to try and find somebody that I think that somehow I'm qualitatively better or superior to. It's, it's not hard to find somebody and think yourself, oh, I'm better than that. And a lot of us can do that. But see, it's one thing for me to compare myself with another person. It's another thing for me to see the Lord Jesus. And when I see myself in comparison to him, how can I help but become humble? Because if you spend time with the Lord, you'll see yourself for who you are. It's like, it's like when Isaiah, when you read the book of Isaiah, you get to chapter 5. In chapter 5 of Isaiah, Isaiah gives a lot of pronouncements. He's already preaching, and he begins to say things like, woe, woe unto those who, and he begins to speak about those who call darkness light and light darkness, bitter, sweet, sweet, bitter, and uh, things of that nature. Woe unto, woe unto, woe unto. And it's interesting, that's in chapter 5. But in chapter 6, he says, when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and he was high, and he was lifted up, and, and his train filled the temple. And, and he sees a picture of the glory of God. He sees that picture. It's actually he's seeing Jesus in reality, because Jesus speaks of that uh, in the Gospel of John, how that, in fact, Isaiah was seeing him, but even so, he, he had been saying, woe unto, woe unto, and woe unto, and then he sees the Lord, and he says, woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. See, it's one thing for us to see the woes of others, but when we see the Lord, we see our own. And once we see ourselves, it's like looking in a mirror. I look really good at three in the morning in the dark. But when you turn the light on and I see myself for what I really am, I'm, I'm not that flattered. I've gone into some dressing rooms and I've tried on shirts and you have to take your shirt off to put on the shirt. And you look at yourself and you say, I hate that mirror. I hate that mirror because <laughs> it's showing me for what I really am. And so the word of the Lord is the mirror that we view ourselves in. And the word of the Lord is that which describes to us and, and informs us concerning the God that we worship. And so when the Holy Spirit illuminates our darkened conscience, the word of God begins to reveal to us who we are and then shows us who Jesus is, then that's where you take the path to humility because you begin to see yourself for who you are, and like Isaiah, you can say, woe unto me, not simply woe unto you. Now we have a tendency of saying, woe unto me, because in fact, I really need the Lord. So again, verse 12, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, before honor is humility. Verse 13, this is an interesting verse. He who answers a matter before he hears it it is folly and shame to him. Um, somebody is speaking and you interrupt them. And, and you're not allowing them to finish their thought. And, and when you do that, you actually dishonor them. And what that does is that reveals our character. It also reveals our lack of intellectual fairness. Because how can you truly respect a person when you refuse to hear him out, 
How can you really understand somebody if you keep interrupting them? So he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. I've said this to you before. It's one of the lessons the Lord taught me when raising kids is, is to learn to literally bite my tongue, to literally bite my tongue. Because as I've shared before, um, there were times when my kids were growing up from childhood to young adulthood, and I had to grow up along with them, and I didn't realize that. I had to learn to allow them to have their own thoughts, because when they're children, you basically are telling them, this is what we believe, this is what we do as children. But at a certain point, they have to own their own beliefs. And when they begin to work out their own beliefs, sometimes the way they're working them out is a little troublesome to me because I don't agree with that at all. So let me give to you a 50 minute lecture as to why the use of that word is not proper. And the Lord finally got to me, you know, and, and said, you've got to listen because you speak, but you don't listen well. And I have to tell you, that was one of the toughest lessons for me to learn. And I literally would bite my tongue, literally, put my tongue between my teeth. And I, I would bite my own tongue to remind me that I'm supposed to shut up. No, that's not all the time, but was a good amount of time. Because I discovered something that as they kept speaking, they actually weren't saying what I thought they were saying. And I started learning to listen and to hear not only the words, but what their feelings were behind those words. Because sometimes the words they were using were incorrect in, descri in describing what they really meant. I had to learn that. And the only way to learn that is to let somebody finish what they're saying. So we don't answer a man, according to verse 13, we don't answer a matter before we hear it because it's folly and shame. In verse 14, the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? The spirit of a man refers to the one who is drawing his strength from God. And the spirit of a man sustains him in sickness. It gives him strength, in other words, to bear with times of sickness or trouble in his life. The spirit of man sustains him in times of trouble. But he goes on to say in verse 14, but who can bear a broken spirit? A broken spirit is a wounded spirit. It's one that's been damaged. It's a, it's a picture of someone who is withdrawing into themselves. And the point is very simple. We understand this. Emotional pain and depression can sap the will to live. You can get to the point when you're in so much emotional pain that you actually don't care if you live or you die. Have you ever been there? Some of you have. Where somebody will actually ask you, do you care if you live or die? And you say, no, not really. Because you're going through so much pain, it really doesn't matter. And that's what he's saying. Who can bear a broken spirit? And so emotional, and, emotional pain and depression can, can sap your will to live. In Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. A good word makes it glad. A good word comes from the word of the Lord, guys. You know, sometimes when you're going through tough times, the first thing people will do is they stop reading the word. They stop being in God's word. Uh, God's word is what speaks to you. God is speaking to you through his word. And what we end up doing is we cut them out of the conversation. And the only thing we're left with is the things that we're feeling, the things that we are thinking. And so one of the worst things I've ever done is I've, I've stopped reading while I've gone through pain rather than continuing hearing from the, the word of the Lord because he wants to speak to me and bring healing. That's why the word of God is so important, but that's also why it's, it's a blessing to have godly friends. Remember in chapter uh, 17, verse 17, how Solomon had said, a friend loves at all times, a brother is born for adversity. When you're all by yourself, when you fall and there's no one there to pick you up, it's a bad place to be. So it's a blessing 
when you have somebody who's alongside of you, a friend who's like a brother, a friend who can help you and, and, and be there for you and listen to you and encourage you and pray for you. And sometimes the best thing that friend can do is not advise you. And there's always plenty of time for advice. But sometimes the best thing he can do is cry with you. Or the best thing they can do is just listen to you without bringing a word of correction, without bringing a, 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 uh, a word of advice. I, I had a friend of mine who was, uh, he was going through his master's program. It was a very intense program. And uh, he was afraid that he had uh, failed his, uh, his uh, failed to produce a, um, a, a master's thesis that was acceptable. He was concerned for it. He was in what we used to call the paper chase. He was moving towards his diploma, his degree. And he was really upset because he didn't know whether he was going to pass or not. He eventually passed. He got a second master's. Then he got a PhD. But at this time, he didn't know if he was going to get his first master's. And he was pretty upset with it. And one of my friends was speaking to him and said to him something like, don't worry about it. Everything's OK. All things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose, which is true, it's scripture. But I looked at my friend who was giving the scriptural advice at that moment, and I said, he doesn't need to hear that right now because he already knows that. What he really needs right now is for us just to listen to him while he, you know, while he says, this is what I'm feeling. Because you know what? I have discovered, and so have you, that there are times we're going through things that are really tough, they're hard, their struggles, we're hurting. And it's, I don't need to be given a whole lot of advice. Sometimes I simply need to be given the comfort of a friend who's next to me for that moment to help me to know I'm not alone. Yes, I know my God is with me. I have no doubt that he is. But again, sometimes you want an arm around your shoulder. That's not the invisible arm of the Lord. But sometimes God's arm is around your shoulder in a sense through a brother or a sister who's saying, I'm with you. I've said this to you before. It's true. Job's comforters did the best job of comforting when they sat there and just didn't say anything. It's when they opened their mouth that, that Job says, well, miserable comforters are you. Because they just said, oh, you know what? I've seen only the unrighteous go through things like this, Job. Just shut up, Jack. I don't need to hear that. Because sometimes what we need is just the person who weeps with those who weep. Somebody who can do that because that's a brother. That's a sister. It's not that they don't want to encourage you. It's not that they don't want to help you. It's that they're going through this with you. And I have to tell you, I've been able to get through an awful lot of things with people who are simply making the journey with me because they know the God that I'm having a bit of a struggle with at that moment. They know he's able. And sometimes it's not that it's their faith that gets me through, but they certainly are an encouragement to me to hold fast. So the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? Verse 15, the heart of the prudent acquires knowledge. The ear of the wise seeks knowledge. And so this actually contrasts a bit with verse 13, where it had said, he who answers a matter before he hears it is folly and shame to him, because now it speaks concerning the heart of the prudent acquiring knowledge and the ear of the wise seeking knowledge. And so the wise in heart are teachable. They eagerly pursue the things of the Lord. Notice how it speaks of acquiring and seeking. So that gives us an insight into pursuit. And this is something that motivates them. Proverbs 1 verse 5 said, A wise man will hear and increase learning. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Proverbs 4 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. So this is something that you pursue. And you are teachable and you're eager to continue learning. Verse 16. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. This is interesting because what it's literally saying is influence can be bought <laughs> with gifts. Uh, a modern uh, picture of that is a lobbyist in Washington. 
They use their finances by influence. So it's not always a good thing. Proverbs 19, 6 said many, says, many entreat the favor of the nobility. Every man is a friend to the one who gives gifts. And so he's simply saying influence can be bought with gifts, and it's not always a good thing that you buy influence. Verse 17, this one has been a very important proverb in my life. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Oh, that's so true, isn't it? Remember this, there are always two sides to every dispute. There are always two sides. <laughs> You'll have someone who will come to you and will say to you, this is what they did to me. And, and, and they hurt me and they this, and they're your friend and you love them to pieces. And you start getting upset because how dare they treat you that way? And you listen to them because they're your friend. And so the person they have the problem with comes in and you're mad at them. You don't even know anything about their side. You're just mad at them and they feel it all over you. So they say, what's wrong? I don't like the way you, you treated my friend. And what did I do? You did this and you did that and you said this and you said that. And then you look at them and you say, but did they tell you this? And then everything starts to change because the first one to plead their cause is always right because that's the single source of information you're getting. Be very careful that you don't show partiality and judgment. Be very careful that you don't take sides with people simply because you love them. Again, we need to be impartial. Plus, we need to be careful not to be recipients of gossip. We don't want them to be tasty trifles in our life. And so be aware of that. There's always, there will always be two sides to a dispute. And sometimes people are won over unfairly because somebody got to them first. Verse 18. Casting lots causes contentions to cease and keeps the mighty apart. Well, when it speaks of casting lots, um, casting lots was a way of trusting God for the answer. That's how they at one time would seek answers from the Lord through this particular system called casting lots. And so, as it says in Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So that was a way of trusting God for an answer. But today, we don't go out there and try and find the Lord's will through doing things like that. What we do now is we spend time in the Word of God, we spend time in prayer, and we spend time seeking the Lord's Holy Spirit to lead us in decisions and, and direct us in our footsteps. So we don't cast lots seeking answers from the Lord. Verse 19, here's another very practical proverb. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. That's very true. When you offend someone that you're very close to, it's very difficult to heal the relationship once it's been broken. Have you discovered that? It's true. Every one of us sometime in our life has somehow violated a friendship in one way or another, and it's hard to win them back because uh, they're so offended. They're so hurt. And you can apologize to your blue in the face. And uh, very often, they just don't want to hear it. They're that upset. So a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. Verse 20, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Uh, that's an interesting proverb. Um, beneficial speech produces satisfaction for the speaker as well as the listener. Uh, Proverbs 12, 14 said, a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. Verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life, now that's interesting. But notice, Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it. The question is, love what? Love it. Love what? Those who love speech. Those who love, when it says the power of the tongue, it's another way of saying the power of speech. 
Uh, those who love talking reap consequences because the things you say will ultimately result in either good or bad consequences. Remember James chapter 3, verse 8, No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And remember Proverbs 10, 19, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. He who restrains his lips is wise. And so if you love to talk, you're going to eventually give enough things to get people upset at you. So be aware of that. Verse uh, 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. We'll talk about that for a minute. <laughs> okay. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Well, the way this is phrased in, in the original language actually carries with it an interesting kind of connotation. Um, it, it's describing, in a sense, by using the term uh, finding a wife, finding a good thing, um, it, it's actually describing, and, and you wouldn't see this if you didn't spend some time looking and seeing what is this literally leading to. It, it's speaking of, of, of uh, a wife and her good qualities. There are good qualities, in other words, uh, of a wife. And when you read your Bible, there are things that you see that, uh, that are great qualities of a good woman, a good wife. And he's speaking of a, a good wife here. And so uh, a good wife, uh, you look through scripture, you'll see that she's, she's what, what we used to call good natured. Um, she's described, and you'll see this later on in Proverbs as being kind. Uh, a good wife is somebody who is uh, described as being wise, um, careful, uh, industrious, and he's actually referring to a, a wife of this nature as being a wife of nobility. So a person who finds a noble wife is finding an exceptional, an exceptional uh, treasure in their life. In, in marriage, In marriage, I'm trying to say this right, not because it's offensive, but because I want to make sense. I, I, every married person in this room will know what I'm saying, and every parent would know what I'm saying when I say it like this. The man that I am today, God, the Holy Spirit, God's Word, salvation. I mean, I can point to that. that. That changed me. But I'm also a man who has been influenced for some time by one woman. And this one woman's qualities have helped to form me into the man who's standing here right now, my wife. Because had I married a woman other than my wife, Marie, that woman, her personality, her goodness, her whatever made her what she is, I would have been responding to her. Because when you get married, it's not all about you. You know this married person. It, you better know this. It's not all about you. It's about us. The two shall become one flesh. I was empty. And then the Lord brings someone into my life that completes me. That's how it works. I, and I, you know, people think I, I, I sometimes they don't think I'm sincere, but I am. I, I am so grateful for my wife because I have a great wife. I really do, and I don't want to embarrass her. She gave me money to say this. That's true, but <laughs> it wasn't that much. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. And, and so many times when I share on these kinds of things, and I'm only taking a moment to do this here, 
I get emotional, but people don't know why. The reason I, I get emotional is I am so thankful for the woman God gave to me that it actually overwhelms me when I start to speak about it. It just does. Because that, you know, you have certain things in your life that are very important. And this is one of those top tier things that are important, right? And so I know that having a good wife is a, is, is a gift from God. I know that. And I know that the woman he gave to me helped me to become the man that others respect. Because she helped me to learn the weaknesses of my own life by contrast with the goodness of hers. And wife, when you're a good woman and your husband loves you, he will become a good man. He will. He will learn how to speak with gentleness. He'll learn how to be kind. He'll learn how to be compassionate. He'll learn how to be generous. He'll learn that, that it's not, not all about him because when he has a good wife, he begins to learn what a blessing it is to give rather than to receive. And he begins to learn how the two do become one flesh. And there are empty portions of his life that are filled up by the goodness of that woman. And when you find, when you have a good wife, it is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. And, and I've seen that in my own life. I've seen that in other people's lives. When that man has a, a good wife, he becomes a good man if he has an intent to be one. If he's not a bully, if he's not a manipulator, if he's not a controller, if he's not a man who, who doesn't appreciate what God does. But if he's a man who is willing to say, I was empty. I needed someone to help to fill up those gaps in my life. And, and God gave me this woman. And I see her as, as what she really is. She's a gift from the Lord to me. You see, I prayed that God would give me the right woman. I prayed most sincerely, God, I make bad choices in life. So please, Lord, uh, 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 in matters of living for the rest of my life with someone, I make bad choices. I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to see what I really need, but Lord, I've come to know that you know exactly what I need Lord, I'm going to go to sleep to my desire, and I'm asking you to bring that one into my life so I don't make poor choices when it comes to something as important as a woman that I'll be married to. And guess what? The Lord brought me Marie. And I understand this scripture. He who finds a wife finds a good thing, obtains favor from the Lord. God blessed me. God has blessed my life. I pray every husband in this room can say the same thing about your marriage, that you have a woman that God would say is, is the good thing for you, that right one for you, the one that was brought into your life to make you whole because until that point you were incomplete and then he brought her to you and he said, this is the one that will make you into a man of God. See, see, my wife has done that for me. She has helped me in so many ways to learn what it means to be a man. A noble woman is a gift from God. Proverbs 31, 10 through 12, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. I, I feel really sorry for Ruby. She's always put down. <laughs> she is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good not harm all the days of her life. But uh, that, that, that's so true. That is beautiful. Okay, moving on. The poor man uses entreaties, but the rich man answers roughly. In other words, a poor man begs because he has no recourse. He has no one to plead his case for him, so he uses entreaties. But the rich man, well, he can answer harshly. Well, basically, it says the rich man answers roughly. The poor man is begging, but the rich man answers roughly because I've heard this before. And so that's basically how that goes. Then finally, 
A man who has friends must himself be friendly. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Let's take a moment and look at this, and then we'll close. You want to have a friend? Be friendly. Well, that makes sense. You know, uh, there, there, there have been times when, when people will say, well, you know, they're, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to make friends. And, and, and that, that can be true. But one of, the, one of the things that we need to cultivate if we want to have friends is we need to cultivate within ourselves a, a, a friendliness towards people, a vulnerability, if you will. Um, prove to be a friendly person yourself because friendly people are attractive. You know, but, but people who are not friendly, well, they're not always that attractive. I mean, it, it, and that happens in churches. I, you come to church and you're used to being seated in a certain place. I, I, I know there are people in this church who think that the chair they're in, when they're in church, that's their chair. That's their chair. That's my chair. And I have seen it. Well, they'll come and they'll look at somebody who's in their chair. <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> like you bought that chair. But, they, but they've, that's my chair, you know. And then there have been times where people say, you know, they're, the, that person's not real friendly towards me, and, and it's hard to make friends. And a long time ago, this, this particular proverb uh, became real to me. When he, he, he says that if you're going to have a friend, you need to be friendly yourself. Sometimes you come to church like this one here, and, and, um, and you'll, you'll be next to somebody, and you'll think they're an unfriendly person because they don't say hi to you. But that person, that's the first time they've been in this church too. And they're looking at you saying, what an unfriendly person. They didn't say hi to me. <laughs> and so it's just real. So you have to be aware of that. So if you're going to have a friend, then be the kind of person who's friendly towards others. But at, uh, there's another portion where it says there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And yeah, we can have some physical friends who are closer than a brother. Uh, I mentioned this last week, I believe, but uh, I have a friend, his name is Bill, and when we were growing up, he lived across the street from me. And I can honestly say to you that from the time we were young until we were, we were in our late teens, um, I actually looked at him as someone I loved more than my own brother Frank, my own blood brother. He was that much closer to me. He just was. There are friends who are actually closer to you, especially believers. You may have an unbelieving family member. There you, you love them. I mean, they're your family. But you have friends in the Lord who are there when you need them and bring spiritual strength to you in your times of need. But who is your very best friend? Here's something that's really important. This is really important. It's so basic that people will think it's too simplistic, but it's not. It's very real. My very, very dearest friend is Jesus Christ. You need to understand that. That's called Christianity, by the way. That's not weirdness or fantasy or imagination. <laughs> That's Christianity. The closest friend you have, closer than your husband or wife, closer than your children, closer than the best friend you have on earth, your very best friend is Jesus Christ. And he will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. He will never ever let you down. He never leaves you alone. He is always by your side. And when your closest friend can't show up, and even though he's texting you, that doesn't, it's not him being there, Jesus is with you. When you understand that, you are never alone. I am never alone. I am never alone, for he is with me. He never has forsaken me. He has never left me by myself. I have always had a sense, my God, it's with me. He will not leave me. He sticks closer than any brother. And that's Jesus Christ. That's where the Christian faith finds its strength. If you're always looking to a human being, that person will eventually let you down. We just do. We just do. Not that we want to, not that we plan on it. We just do. 
because we're failures at perfection. That's just the bottom line. That's why I can love my friends, but I know they're human and they will make mistakes. They will do things that can hurt. They will make me feel sometimes like I'm all alone. But I have to tell you, and this is not pretend. I'm not saying this just because I'm a pastor. I'm saying this because I'm a Christian. Jesus has never left me, nor has he ever forsaken me. He has been with me through the highs of my life and the deepest lows I've ever experienced. And he has never left me. He has carried me when I cannot carry myself. He has been beside me because he's not only beside me by his spirit, he lives within me. He instructs me by his word. And he gives me great comfort when others can't because he knows every single thing about me, everything. He knows my testimony in a way I've never told anybody else. He knows the real complete one. And guess what? He still loves me. And because he knows everything about me and still loves me, who is my best friend? Jesus Christ. There is a friend who is closer to you than any brother, and that's Jesus. Make sure you understand that today.